And now, the Mole Mystery Theater, presented by M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skin. Good evening. This is Jeffrey Barnes, welcoming you to the program that presents the best in mystery and detective fiction. Tonight's story is a hard-boiled gangster tale written by Martin Ryerson and entitled Alibi for Murder. It's about a very ordinary young man named Dave Whitman who was destined from birth to be involved in two gangland killings. Yes, destined from birth. Puzzling? Perhaps it'll all be quite clear when you meet gangster Steve Yeager. Before you begin your story, Mr. Barnes, here's some good advice for men. If you have a wiry, hard-to-cut beard or a tender skin, and that morning shave of yours is just short of murder, then shave with Mole, the heavier brushless shaving cream. Yes, sir, man, it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole, the heavier brushless cream for tender skins. That's right. Mole is a heavier cream. The kind of cream you need if you have wiry whiskers or a tender skin. Because Mole is heavier, it not only softens your whiskers, it stands them up straighter and makes them easy to cut. So you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly with Mole. The heavier brushless cream for tender skins. Mole. And now here is Jeffrey Barnes with tonight's Mole mystery, Alibi for Murder. Three men stand in the windowless, ill-lighted little room in the huge warehouse. They are staring in awe at the unconscious man sprawled out on the rickety cot before them. Finally, one of the men speaks. It's unbelievable, Steve. I read about things like this, but I never expected to see it actually happen. How bad's he hurt, Doc? One bullet grazed the back of his head. It's the slug buried in his shoulder might cause trouble. He should go to a hospital. Hospital, nothing. You do this job yourself at my place. But, Steve, it's dangerous. He could die. But he ain't gonna die. You're going to make sure he don't. Okay, Steve, you're the big boss. You know, I never argue with you. Bob. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Yeager? You're sure nobody knows about him except you? Well, it happened just like I told you, Mr. Yeager. I heard the shots while I was making my nice rounds of the warehouse. I ran outside, and there he was, laying in a heap on the sidewalk. And the car that the shots came from, beating it away in the darkness. At first, I thought this was you, Mr. Yeager. Well, you did, huh? You didn't catch the plates in the car, did you? No, it was too dark, Mr. Yeager. Okay, Pop, thanks a lot for calling me. I won't forget it. Just keep it under your scalp. Oh, don't worry, Mr. Yeager. I won't say a word. I'm sure you won't. Better get back in your rounds now, Pop. I don't want to hold you up and make you late. Okay, Mr. Yeager. You're very considerate. Good night. Oh! Oh! Steve, you... You shot him in the back. What's that gag about dead men keeping their mouths shut, Doc? Okay, bust things up, make it look like a robbery. Then let's get this Joe over to my apartment. Oh, oh. Oh. He's coming out of it, Steve. Oh. I want to see what he does when he lamps me for the first oh. time. He's lifting his head off the pillow. <clears throat> Looking around. He sees you. <gasps> I wonder, did I look as surprised when I first saw him? He can't figure it out, Steve. Guess he thinks he's looking in the mirror. It's okay, pal. You ain't seeing things. It's us. Two of us. Two of us? That's right. This is me and that's you. You and me. They made one of us first and forgot to throw away the mold. That's... It's unbelievable. You're almost identical twins. Same height, same weight, same faces, same coloring. What's your name, pal? Whitman, Dave Whitman. We found you in front of the warehouse down by the river. You had a nasty hunk of lead in your shoulder. 
Doc here had a rough time fishing it out. You're a doctor? Yeah, this here is Doc Kinsella. I'm Steve Yeager. You're going to see a lot of us. I don't understand what you mean, Mr. Yeager. Never mind. You uh, got many friends in town, Whitman? No, I just arrived here tonight on a freight. Riding the rails, huh? A hobo? No, no, just out of a job. That's what I had hoped to find here. I figured I'd find me a flop down by the river in that big building. My warehouse. Oh, it is? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, anyway, all of a sudden, a car comes racing around the corner and lets me have it. Only that little lead party wasn't meant for you. That was a surprise cooked up for years truly. For you, Mr. Yeager? Yeah, friends of mine. They took you for me. Then they bust in and murdered a watchman. But I don't get it. Forget it. So you're looking for work, huh? Yeah, any kind of work. Well, what would you say to a job with me? In your warehouse? No, not exactly. This lend you a lot bigger piece of change than working down there. I don't know what that slug did to my brain, but if this is how it feels to be crazy, brother, I want to stay that way. <laughs> yeah, I think you and me are going to get along okay, Whitman. Now, see if you can grab some sleep. Come on, Doc. Lock the door. Why? He can't... Lock go. the door. Why, Steve? I don't want anybody to know I got me a spitting image. Sit down, Doc. Uh, Steve, what exactly do you want with Whitman? I want him so I can be in two places at once. There's a few things I've been wanting to tend to for a long time, Doc. Only I needed an alibi. I don't follow you, Steve. It should be simple for a guy with a brain big enough to earn him an M.D., if I had a big brain, Steve, I'd never allowed myself to be handed my walking papers by the medical association. All right, skip it. Now, look. I don't like the kind of competition that's crawled into this town. You mean Goldie Mice? For one. Slapsy Higgins, number two. Yeah, whose gunman do you think it was the other night? Slapsy's. He goes in for that strong arm stuff. Goldie's too wise for that stuff. I know, Steve. I heard Goldie's lining up with a lot of tin horn politicians in town. Guys who can do you lots of harm. Which means that Goldie and Slapsy got to be discouraged, but quick. And Whitman, even though he don't know it, is going to help me do it. Well, kids, you're looking fine. No one had guessed that ten days ago you had a slug in you. Yeah, Doc. All right, Whitman, let me look at you. And keep that bow tie straight. And it keeps twisting. Well, don't let it twist. And don't drop the bottom button on your tux. Huh? Yeah, pull that handkerchief out of your pocket a little further like that. Okay. All right. Let's go over to the mirror and see. Well, Doc, what do you say? Except by instinct, Steve, I'd say it was improbable. Even your own mothers could tell you apart. <laughs> I hardly know which of us is me. Neither one of us is you. We're both me. And don't forget it, even for a second. Yeah, okay, Steve. Now you're going to my nightclub with Doc. Your nightclub? That's right. The Silver Swan. I own it. Doc will point out everybody in the place to you. Tell you anything and everything you need to know about him. If you get in a spot and you don't know what the answer is, just stick us a guy in your face and let Doc do the talking. You got it? Yeah, I got it. Now, there's only one rub. What's that, Steve? Lorraine. Oh, Lorraine. She's your girl, isn't she? How do you know about her? I read all about her on those clippings in your press book. Sings at your nightclub. Uh, is she really as pretty as that photo on the piano? Never mind how pretty she is or ain't. Now, Steve, you, uh, you usually kiss her when she comes over to the table. Now, if he doesn't kiss her, she might get suspicious and ask questions. Okay, Whitman, you'll have to kiss her. Oh, I will? But make it quick. And when you do kiss her, grab her like I do. Come here, I'll show you how. Uh, maybe you two would like to be alone. Shut up! Uh, don't you dance with her or anything, Steve? No, kiss her quick, Whitman, and get rid of her. Tell her that you and Doc got important business. Say you'll see her after the last show. By that time, I'll be there, and you'll be back here in the penthouse again. You understand? I understand, Steve. Doc, this is just about the greatest experience of my whole life. Yes, the club starts to ride pretty high at midnight Saturdays. This place must have cost Steve a small fortune. It did. But you better close your mouth and stop gaping like you never saw it before. Don't forget you're supposed to be the person who owns it. Here comes the waiter. Order rye highball. But I like scotch and soda. Steve likes rye highball. Oh. Evening, Mr. Yeager. 
Hiya, Doc. Hello, Mike. What'll it be, Mr. Yeager? The usual? Yeah, Mike. Right high ball. Coming right up, boss. Uh, see that white-haired man with the party at the ringside table over there? Yeah? That's John Martin, city magistrate. Wave to him. Okay. He a friend of Steve's? Yeah, sort of. Steve must know important people. Yeah. Remember me, mister? Huh? Why all the surprise? You look as if you never saw me before. Hello, Lorraine. Hi. Lorraine. Well, who would you think I was? Why are you staring? Oh, I was just thinking. I don't know whether I ever told you before, but do you know that photo of you doesn't have to you justice? No, Steve, you never told me. Uh, <clears throat> uh, oh, yeah, do you mind if I kiss you? You don't usually ask, do you? No, I guess not. Well. Anything wrong? Hardly. Oh, you look stunned. Maybe it's because you never kissed me like that before. It seemed to be something different. Uh, but Steve, don't forget we've got a lot of important business to talk over. Oh, yeah, yeah, business. Uh, I'll see you after the last show, Lorraine. Doc and I have got some important angles to work out. Yeah, sure, Steve, I understand. See you later. Gosh. Now, look, kid. Don't let's get any silly ideas. She's all wrapped up with a big expensive tag on the reeds. Hands off, property of Steve Yeager. Yeah, yeah, I know, Doc. Oh, oh, there's the signal from Steve Whitman. Now, you slip into his office and out the back door. Steve will take your place and none the wiser. You sure nobody caught wise he wasn't me sitting at this table all the while, Doc? No one, Steve. Not even Lorraine. Uh Uh-oh. Hang on to your bridge work, Doc. Here it comes. Where? Through the front door. McAfee and Fennec. Yeah, the headquarters twins. Well, well, if it ain't my two old sidekicks, Sergeant McAfee and Joe Fennec. Grab chairs and sit down, boys. What are you drinking? Sorry, Steve, but uh, this isn't that kind of a visit. Goldie Mize has just been bumped. Goldie Mize? Less than an hour ago, Steve. No kidding, man. Oh, that's tough. Goldie was an okay guy. What, uh, what's that got to do with me? Well, uh, Captain got an idea in his head. He wants you brought to headquarters for questioning. Mac, I've been here in the club with Doc ever since midnight. You sure, Steve? All the time? Sitting right here at this table we were. Well, of course, though, except for about three minutes when I went into the office to write out a check. And we have everybody here in the club to prove we were here. There's John Martin, Health Commissioner Woods. They'll vouch for you? Uh, sure, you want me to call him over? Skip it, I'll talk to them later. Sorry, Steve. <laughs> Guess we made a mistake. Yeah. <laughs> I guess you did. As the curtain falls on Act One of our story, it looks as though Steve Yeager has an ironclad alibi as far as the death of Goldie Mize is concerned. In just a moment, we'll see what the next move is. Before you continue, Mr. Barnes, I'd like to say something to our men listeners. Men, I've been asking you for quite a while now to use Mole Brushless Shaving Cream. Well, if you haven't used it yet, why not give your beard and skin a real break and try a Mole Shave? When you do, I'm sure you'll find that Mole lives up to everything I've said about it. I've pointed out that Mole is a heavier cream, and it is. The kind of cream you need if you've got a wiry, hard-to-cut beard or a tender skin. It not only softens your whiskers, it holds them up better and lets your razor breeze right through them. In other words, when you shave with Mole, you shave faster, closer, easier, and you shave painlessly. Now, maybe that sounds pretty strong. But if you'll just try a Mole shave, I think you'll agree with me when I say it's smooth. So smooth. It's slick. So slick. It's a smooth, smooth, slick, slick shave you get with M-O-L-L-E. Mole. The heavier brushless shaving cream for tender skins. Mole. And now back to Jeffrey Barnes and Act Two of Alibi for Murder. By a strange coincidence, the down-and-out Dave Whitman is a perfect double for the notorious gangster Steve Yeager. 
While Dave poses as Jaeger in the latter's nightclub, the gangster commits a murder. Now Jaeger and his sidekick, Doc, are entering Jaeger's apartment. <laughs> Did you see that Mac of his puss when I told him I was sitting in a club all the time? <laughs> <laughs> and how quickly he backed down we started rattling off the names of the witnesses who saw you in the club. Yeah. <laughs> Whitman, what do you call this? Why, you got your old clothes on. The clothes you had on when we picked you up. You couldn't have been taking yourself a quick run out, Potter Whitman. That's exactly what I'm taking, Mr. Yeager. I didn't expect you back quite so soon. There's a note in your room telling you I'm resigning the fine job you gave me. Resigning? Yeah. When I took this job, I didn't know it included murder. Murder? I heard all about it on the radio a few minutes ago. Charlie McCarthy's on the radio. You don't believe everything he says, do you? It won't work, Steve. You wanted me to take your place at the club tonight so I'd be your alibi while you killed a man named Goldie Mize. Well, it lets me out. I'm through as of right now. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute, pal. You got this thing all wrong. Ah, Steve, you're the one who's got it wrong. I'm washed up. I'm gone. Stay away from that door, Whitman. Let's go my arm, Steve. Sure, I'll let go right on your kisses. Okay, Jaeger, two can play at that game. I wouldn't try it, Whitman. You might find a little tough opposition in this gun I'm holding. Yeah, hey, take this handkerchief and wipe the blood off your mouth. I don't like the sight of blood. That's better. If you're smart, Whitman, you'll also get any idea you might have about squawking to the police right out of your brain. That's right. Unless you want to sit in my lap in the electric chair. What do you mean? No one would believe you and Steve weren't in on this thing together. Nobody would ever believe you didn't know what you were doing. Doc's right. Get smart. Yeah, smart. There's plenty in this for you. Now, what about it? I don't seem to have any choice. Now, we'll work the same game Monday night. Okay. And look, Whitman... Just in case you try anything, Doc's going to have a gun on you from the time you walk out this door until you get back again. Right, Doc? Check. Doesn't this club ever have a slow night, Doc? It's jam-packed again tonight. Yeah. What do you keep looking around over your shoulder for? Expecting somebody? I'll be seeing you, Doc. Hey, where are you going? I had to meet the somebody I was looking for. She just came through that little door we were talking about. Wait, come back here. Hi. Oh, hello, Steve. Hey, you sound surprised. First time I ever saw you come to meet me. Anything wrong? Wrong? Yeah, you stepped back away from me as I went to kiss you. Oh, I'm sorry, Steve. Oh... You look bewildered. I am. Why? Why, you kissed me just now. You kissed me like that Saturday night when I came to your table. Something about it seems so different. Oh, uh, Steve, we got business to talk over, remember? Oh, yeah, Doc. I tell you what. You sit down and get all the details worked out, and I'll come back and argue the whole thing out with you. But, uh, as that argument in my pocket might not wait. Are you trying to tell me you'd use an argument like that on Steve Yeager in front of all these nice people? But... Uh... I said sit down, Doc. No, I mean sit down. Okay. Okay. I'll be waiting. Doc seems to be kind of unhappy about something. Doc's getting old, Lorraine. No more romance. <laughs> I never heard you mention the word romance before. Well, there's a lot of words you probably haven't heard me say that you're going to hear. Shall we dance? Love to. Lorraine? Yeah? I've been wondering lately. Are you really in love with a guy named Steve Yeager? That's a funny question. But now that you've asked it, I always liked your looks and type, Steve. But except for twice, I'm afraid I've never been really in love with a man inside. You said except for twice? That's right. Saturday and... Tonight? Uh-huh. I just can't explain it, Steve. I suppose it sounds kind of silly. But you almost don't seem like the same person. Now, how do we get back here in the gambling room? Maybe it's because I said I felt lucky. How lucky? Tonight, just about the luckiest person alive. You got a quarter, lady? Could be. Why? Let me have it. We'll pool our interests. I've got a dime. 
A very lucky dime. I thought you'd never get This is a special occasion. Let's have the quarter. All right. Here you are. Here, you drop this lucky dime into your purse. There. But I... Come on, let's try our quarter on these slot machines. All right. Ah, this looks like a lucky machine. Here. You drop in the quarter. Okay. Now, I'll yank the lever. Those little wheels are spinning just like my brain. It's all so mixed up. Four bars. Jackpot! Oh, those quarters! Oh, they must be easily ten dollars. <laughs> Tell you what, you take these quarters to the cashier and get one blue chip. Steve, I'm so sorry to be long. Shut but... up. Where's Whitman? Been cooling my heels in this office for the past half hour. You know I can't leave here until he comes. He was at the big table, Steve. Let Lorraine walk away with five G's. Five grand? The dealer naturally thought he was you. Every time he smiled, the dealer touched a little button under the table and the bell stopped on the number Lorraine had her chips you on. You stupid fool. This is all your fault. But, Steve... Shut up. Get him over to the penthouse and keep him there. I'll be over later. Okay, Steve. Whitman, I'll break his neck when I get him that punk. Hey, boss. Yeah, Louis. The headquarters twins just came in. Says they want to buzz you about the murder of Slapsy Higgins. Okay. Tell Lorraine I want her in here. Lorraine ducked out a few minutes ago, boss. Where'd she go? I don't know, but she looked in off a hurry. I wonder. You wonder what, boss? Nothing. The car out back? Yeah, in the alley. Okay, Louie, I want you to drive me home. Fast. This is Jeffrey Barnes again. In just a few moments, we'll bring you Act Three of Alibi for Murder. When you have dandruff, you might just as well try to combat it with plain water as with most ordinary hair preparations. For such products, simply remove loose dandruff, and you can do that with plain water. To do more, to fight dandruff effectively, use double dandrine. For double dandrine is a scientific product that does what most ordinary hair preparations can't do. It goes to work on your scalp and actually kills on contact the germs that many outstanding authorities contend are a cause of a common type of dandruff. Now, the reason for double dandrine's amazing effectiveness is that it contains a special ingredient called Alzan, an active antiseptic so remarkably efficient, many hospitals use it. Among hair preparations, double dandrine and double dandrine alone contains Alzan. So stop trying to combat dandruff with preparations that can't compare with double dandrine. If you're not satisfied, return the empty bottle and get your money back. Buy double dandrine at your druggists. Lorraine, you shouldn't have come here to the penthouse. It's Lorraine. Then you're Suppose not Steve, Steve should. Steve Yeager. Oh, darling, I'm glad. I'm so glad. Oh, Lorraine, darling. I tried so many times to tell you the truth tonight, but for once, Doc's right. You shouldn't have come here. Who are you? My name's Whitman, Dave Whitman. Don't say any more. Whitman, I warn you. Steve used me as his alibi for murder. I would have made a break for it, but I couldn't go without you. With that money we won tonight, Lorraine, I hoped we could go away somewhere and start over. You've got to go, Lorraine. If Steve finds you, he'll kill both of you. You're reading my mind, huh, Doc? Steve. Steve, I, I didn't hear you come in. Louie just drove me over from the club. Well, it's like something out of the movies. The big hero with a protecting arm around the girl's waist. Kind of corny, Whitman. So this is why you took the quick run out from the club, huh, Lorraine? I was right. There are two of you. But not for long. Whitman, where are those rags you first came in? Why? Don't ask questions. Where are they? In the bottom of the closet in the bedroom. All right, Doc. Keep that gun of yours aimed at his shirt stud. I got me a quick change to make. <laughs> I didn't keep you waiting too long. Well, Doc, what are you gaping at? Gosh, Steve, you, you look just like Whitman did that first night. The clothes, everything, even your must-up hair. Yeah, not to dump these things. Hey, that, that's your wallet and credentials you're putting on the table. Don't need them anymore. 
Now, Doc, I'll take your rod. Sure, sure, Steve. Here, but uh, I don't understand. It's simple, Doc. This is the end of the line. This is where you three get off. Three? And Steve Yeager goes on alone. But, Steve... You've outlived your usefulness, Doc. Besides, you and these two are the only people in the world who know I have a double. But, Steve, I wouldn't talk. You know that. I know you haven't talked so far. But, Steve, I'm not Popper Slaps you, Goldie. I'm your friend. I'm taking no chances, Doc. You, this two-time and dame, and the phony Steve Yeager get the lights blown out here and now. Steve, no, please. I had it figured out for a long time, Doc. You and a dame get it with my gun. Then while you're dying, you give it a Whitman here with your gun. Anyway, that's how it's going to look to the cops. You're going to make them think Dave is you? That he killed Doc? That's right. It's going to look swell in the tabloids. Doc can tell a fooling around with Steve Yeager's girl, and who walks in but Steve? You'll never get away with it, Yeager. Why won't I? The cops haven't even got a fingerprint of me. I'll just fade into the ozone and become a character named Dave Whitman. But why, Steve? Goldie's gone, slaps has gone. You've no more competition in town. So, Steve. <laughs> Bad. Doc wasn't a bad guy. You ain't kidding, Mac. What? Doc was the best. Louie. Eyes front and drop the gun. Don't be crazy, Louie. Take that rod out of my back. Drop it, I said. I don't know what you're doing, Louie. Shut up and turn around so I can look at you. All right, you satisfied it's me? Steve. And another Steve over there. Am I seeing double or something? Of course you're not seeing double. I'm Steve Yeager. This guy's just a hobo. I don't know. I'd say you look more like the hobo in them clothes. Louie, don't be stupid. I'm Steve, I tell you. Look at me. Yeah. Yeah, Louie, look at us. Good. I'm all mixed up. Now, it's simple, Louie. It's just a shakedown. He found out he looked like me, killed a couple of people, and then tried to blackmail me. He's lying, Louie. I'm Steve Yeager. If he was Steve Yeager, would he shoot Doc Kinsella, his best friend? No. No, I guess he wouldn't. Louie, he's trying to confuse you. Look, they're my credentials on the table. No, Louie, they're my credentials. I just told you he was trying to shake me down. I want to be sure. I wouldn't want to pull this trigger on the wrong guy. You'll be pulling it on the wrong guy if you kill me. Wait a second, Louie. You know whose girl Lorraine is, don't you? Sure, everybody knows that. She's Steve Yeager's girl. Then ask her which one of us she loves. It's a trick, a dirty, rotten trick. Of... <laughs> oh, that wasn't very smart, him trying to rush my gun. Gosh, I didn't want to kill a guy. But, well, you saw for yourself, Steve. He was grabbing for my gun. Was either him or me? We've got to get out of here quick before the police come. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we better get out of here. You go ahead, Louis. A few things i got to clean up here. Yeah, okay, Paul. Quick, lock the door. Right. Good. Now then. What are you doing, Dave? The only thing we can do. I'm calling the police. <laughs> place where people won't take me for Steve Yeager's ghost. Mm. Brother, what a job it was straightening out that mess with the police. Yes, especially after they picked up Louie and he insisted you were Steve. Mm. What are you thinking about, darling? Well, honey, two weeks ago I rode into town in a freight car with a thin dime in my pocket. Now I'm riding out of town with the world in the palm of my hand. <laughs> Now, this is Jeffrey Barnes again, inviting you to be with us next week when we present a great study in suspense entitled The Creeper by Joseph Rusko. The original music for the Mole Mystery Theater is composed and conducted by Alexander Semler. Alibi for Murder was written and adapted for radio by Martin Ryerson. Elspeth Eric, Mandel Kramer, and John Sylvester were featured in tonight's program. This is Dan Seymour saying good night until next Friday at this same time when the Mystery Theater presents The Creeper. <laughs> Tonight's Mystery Theater presentation came to you from Radio City in New York. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.